I'm, I'm Barbara Mead. I'm one of the founders of Politics and Prose, and I came in this afternoon to introduce Ron Peskai. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a different format this afternoon. Um, Ron is going to be in conversation with Howard Norman. Um, and after uh, the event is over, we're going to have the signing downstairs in the remainder room. So uh, leave your chairs and uh, go, down, go down the front steps to have a book signed. Uh, I got to tell you, it really is intimidating to introduce two great stars of the book world. Though Howard told me that Ron is not a star. Uh, he's a, a constellation, <laughs> <laughs> which was not very much comfort to me in my anxiety. Um, uh, in turn, Ron writes that Howard has long been his counsel in both living and writing. His in indispensable sh sh shuttle uh, chum, he calls Howard. Incidentally, Howard is going to be here on May 31st to read from his new novel, Next Life Might Be Kinder. Uh, Publishers Weekly previewed that uh, Howard's new novel with a starred review and described it as a remarkable achievement of st strange and tragic love story told with great power and beauty. Uh, Ron was Wall Street at the Wall Street Journal senior national affairs reporter, and it was during that time that he was reporting for the Wall Street Journal that he wrote a feature story. Uh, about an African-American student at Ballou, one of Washington's worst high schools, who went on to Brown University. Ron won a, a Pulitzer Prize for that book, for that story, and expanded it into a heartfelt book, Hope in the Unseen. And after that book, then Ron switched to inv the investigative reporting mode and wrote four bestsellers about the darker ways of, Washing of Washington's political work. And now he's return Ron has returned to his roots with a book permeated by the same humanity uh, that he brought to Hope in the Unseen. The book is titled Life Animated, and it's the story of Owen, Ron's son's remarkable journey, starting with his descent into autism and then his uh, rise up to independent living on Cape Cod. Until they moved back to Cambridge, Ron and Cornelia, his wife, and their sons, Walter and o Owen, lived right here in our neighborhood and were familiar faces in the store. Ron is now senior fellow at Harvard's Edmund Safra Center for Ethics a position demanding enough that he, it comes as no surprise that this book was a family affair. Ron modestly describes his role as only the designated writer. Uh, Owen's mother, Cornelia, is a verit veritable hive of family narrative history and decis decision making. Her role as CEO in parenting Owen is beyond imagination, <laughs> just beyond imagination. I mean, she was not only queen of the hive, but she was the number one worker bee, too. Um, but I think that Ron and Cornelia would say that the, indip the indispensable ingredient in Owen's success story is that, uh, uh, in Owen's success, is the stories, Owen's stories. And here's Ron who was also the desig designated family's designated speaker for this afternoon to tell us all about it. Thank you, Ron. God, I feel so tall all of a sudden. <laughs> I've always wanted this. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Enjoy it while you can. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I want to begin by saying um, something that I should have said long ago, that the uh, journey of uh, seeing a book like this unfold on a personal level, including um, all-night conversations in Vermont, uh, has been just an extraordinary honor for me. Um, and 
Um, I have just a couple of questions to open things up with with Ron, and then because the whole family is here, and um, the book's characters, if you will, are all here, it'd be good just to defer right away and as soon as possible to Ron and them. But I, I had something different planned, except that I got over close to 250 emails from politics and pros um, customers or, or fans of, uh, of Ron's books, I should say. So I had to retailer things to sort of uh, attend to those um, uh, questions, um, and it's ve it's very very difficult to distill things down to their particulars. But I'm going to jump right in. Um, when a uh, when a true writer and a serious writer writes a book, uh, there's a rather startling transition from the private room or the private family realm to uh, the public from the mental solitude to the public. So uh, to some extent all writers experience that. That's one thing, but it's quite another thing to have done what Ron has done, which is to move from uh, the, the privacy of this journey that Owen and his family have been on to, um, you know, having Brian Williams come to your house. Uh, that, that's a startling transition. So I thought just as an opening um, way of uh, an entree into this discussion, because uh, so many people wrote and asked about this, um, how um, one uh, navigates that, I thought maybe Ron could, could talk a little bit about the unforeseen elements and the gifts of, uh, of doing this, because I know personally there was discussions about this. A certain amount of um, anticipation, I'm putting it euphemistically, fear, about what fear. It's mostly fear. fear and trepidation <laughs> uh, about uh, what this would be like, um, let alone the fact that there was tremendous response from the uh, uh, autistic community, which we'll hear about uh, at Great Lakes. Just astonishing things have happened already, and the book's just published. So, Ron, please, if you will, just sort of talk about that transition and the last few weeks maybe of what's been going on. Uh, gr great, I'll just talk uh, loud because I don't think this, this is on. Um, it's on. It's on. Oh, is it on now? Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, well, uh, I mean, Owen uh, is helpful in guiding us all on these issues of narrative, which is really the question here. It's about the stories you tell yourselves and the yeah. stories you live within. Uh, and uh, on the way over, Owen uh, uh, was thinking about all the people who are going to be here. Um, these uh, are the three main characters of the book. I'm with them as the central characters. But the fact is, is that many people here are characters in a way in this book because they're characters in this journey. And, uh, and as Owen and I were talking about that in the car pulling up, he's like, this is, a, this is weird, Dad. I said, yes, it is, Owen. <laughs> Everyone's going to be there. I said, pretty much, honey, pretty much. This, this is like, kind of like a bar mitzvah without the Hebrew. I said, <laughs> pretty much. And it's kind of that way for the whole family. Uh, as if you are members of our, my, our tribe, uh, you know that that bar mitzvah moment is kind of that moment where you step out into the public of a community at 13. And it is a shocking moment, generally. And, and we are going through that now, uh, in a way, as a family. Um, and so we're going to have one of these family bar mitzvahs every year or so as we go forward uh, because the sensations are, are startling. And the private public thing that Howard's talking about was an area of great concern and question and a lot of, you know, late night talks with Cornelia and me. Um, I've lived a fairly public life uh, as an enemy of the United States of America. Uh, not always, but sometimes. And, uh, and, and we, meanwhile, were, had a very, uh, well, the seminal thing driving all the public actions was a private story and a private life that we kept private. And uh, now everyone knows what that was. We kind of lifted the curtain. And that was a family decision, uh, and one that was driven in part by Owen, 
uh, arriving at an age of um, kind of clarity and awareness and saying, I want people to know who I am and who people like me are. And, uh, and we said, okay, that's when he was around 19, he arrived at that point. And then Cornelia and I looked at each other and said, all right, well, this is going to be tricky. You know, it's like you're going to, you're walking naked in public forever. <laughs> and can we do that? And, uh, and then after many moments of soul search, we said, look, could this book have been a book like this, have been helpful to us uh, 15, 20 years ago when, you know, we were in, really in hell and in confusion and fear and darkness? And of course, that was, you know, Cornelia posed the question knowing the answer. And of course, that was yes. This would have helped us a lot. And so now, in the month and uh, two weeks since that New York Times excerpt came out on March 7th, we have been caught in the curl of a giant warm wave from uh, all over. I mean, we've got a thousand emails in the queue and another hundred come every every few hours from families, from specialists, from leading autism researchers, from just people like, you know, Howard said something, you know, and Howard has been my my rabbi, and I, 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 use, I would use that for a Gentile person too, but Howard <laughs> happens to be, it works, especially with Howard, and here, and in this process, and, but at one point when Howard had read a part of the book, and it was very emotional, we're up late talking, and how do I feel, how does he feel, he said, you know, I, and he could tell you better, he says, you know, I, I go to the supermarket now, and there's a young man there who I have been looking through uh, in, in my life, in my visits, and now I can't do, can't do that anymore. I, I see him, and he sees me back. Well, that comment that Howard made, uh, and it, you know, we both are very, he was very emotional, got very messy on the phone that night, if you remember, yeah. Uh, that has been replicated by a thousand. For people, many of whom who had no connection with autism, just had a connection with life as we live it, and maybe as we hope we might live it better or differently. So, uh, so that then gets you to Brian Williams and Leslie Stahl knocking on your door. <laughs> now the interesting part is mostly they want to talk to Owen, which is, so Cornelia and I are officially sidekicks now, forever. <laughs> Owen oh, created the architecture, the sidekicks in here, as he helped us, educated us, and we are delighted to forever be in the role of helping the hero fulfill his destiny, which is Owen's <laughs> definition to us. That's what a sidekick does. Mm -hmm. And now, oddly, Leslie Stahl is a sidekick as well, you know, which is a little hard for her, but she came around, <laughs> and Owen brought her around. I mean, it was amazing to watch, and we can tell you funny tales of that in the Q&A, but... It's, it's it's been lovely so far. All of our fears, um, none of them have been realized, and our hopes uh, uh, have been. So, Brian, uh, uh, I mean Roger Williams, who, um, as many of you know, won a uh, Academy Award for documentary film, and is making a documentary now, uh, sponsored by um, this book, but also um, uh, the Suskind family's journey. Um, and uh, obviously the, uh, the gravitas and the sense of biographical uh, probity that a, uh, a documentary film has is quite different, this is the world's biggest understatement, quite different from a feature film. And so it's happening as the book is, I, I called the Film Institute in New York and they said they can't remember another example of a documentary being made as the life of a, another work of art and another genre that is a book is starting to unfold. So there's a sort of dual sense of immediacy about this uh, situation. But it is also another act of trust, uh, I will just put it bluntly, to, um, it's one thing to, to, to go and meet people for the next number of months. It's another to, uh, have an, uh, an engagement with a documentary film, which will be around a long, long time, 
and not only have to define the moment, but in some sense comport itself in a way that will enter posterity. So I don't believe that you've experienced this before, Ron, unless there's some secret film about you out there that I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so I wonder if you could just sort of address that. It's also under the same uh, auspices as uh, coming out into public, obviously. Yeah, yeah. You and this know, is going to be at Sundance uh, already next year, I think. Yeah, right? yeah. That's yeah. the hope, uh, yeah. or the plan, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. You know. Um, so we're all uh, part of a documentary now, uh, everyone here. So. Um, I'd like you to sing a couple numbers from Beauty and the Beast, uh, if you would. I think, uh, oh, and what do you think would be a favorite song from Beauty and the Beast? Be Our Guest. Be Our Guest. Uh, not oh, bad. Just, not I bad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we're going to turn it over to <laughs> Owen. Uh, you know, we, we are on an adventure, and now that we are utterly outed uh, by Owen and this notion of shared possibility, um, it's just um, we're saying what's what's there to hide or hold back. Let's see how it goes. You know, I mean, all the you know, it's all about a conversation. We have it in the house. Cornelia and I have it at the kitchen table. All the books that I've written have mostly been us talking to each other, you know, and periodically me saying I don't see how I can do that, and her saying I don't see how you can't. You know, she's ferocious. It's that Irish thing. It's breathtaking. <laughs> and you know and I go okay okay you know and and so now the conversation has gotten bigger and is getting bigger by the hour including extraordinary adventures which we can tell you about especially when all of us talk about um the last couple of weeks you know we went out last Friday to the Disney Animation Studios and there was a celebration for Owen at Disney So, so I think uh, let's open up our colloquy here. What do you think, Howard? Yeah, I have one really little quick anecdote. Okay. I live in rural Vermont a good deal of the year, and Ron and Cornelia and family have a house a little further south. Well, Ron would come up and, you know, hang out, and we would go through this book. And, and one night, my neighbor, who lives just up the road, um, was coming back late from Boston. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. And apparently he passed by the house and looked in through our farmhouse window and saw Ron wildly, you know, as I like to say, making a point. Uh, and, 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 and got, and the next morning I went out very, very early and he was kind of hovering around our mailbox and said, is everything all right? <laughs> and I said, it's my friend Ron. He was um, just just starting to get engaged <laughs> with the conversation. Uh, but I wanted just to mention one thing, that the process of working with Ron, um, build, constructing this book, or my responding to what he was writing, of course, um, had its own uh, evolution. Because at the beginning, and as Cornelia, I think, can attest as well, um, the Ron is, is, is charmingly autocratic. And, and that means that when you're discussing something and, and you have a real serious thing you want to say, Ron uh, will compliment you. And then you know you're in trouble. <laughs> so I learned how to, to really deal with this because he had um, things he was writing in which you were somewhat ambivalent at first. You didn't know where it was going to go. So over the course of five, six, seven months, and Ron writes in a fugue state, you know, once he starts going, I've never experienced anything like that. So, again, it, 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 it's not only just the personal aspect and intimate aspect of what's literally in the book, but the, um, the, the, the thing that prefaced all that was the, the, the struggle of the writing itself, um, which is something people don't usually hear about and know about, but it, it, was v it registered very deeply in our lives, and it was really impressive to see well, let, let me just tell a little about how Howard is also a, a, an anchor tenant here at Politics and Prose, many of you, you know, know. You've hugged him downstairs. Well, Howard and I have lived in this building at different parts of our life, <laughs> often down in the cafe. We were here during that dark day when they took the plugs out of the cafe downstairs. 
It was a tough day for us. <laughs> because it meant our time here would be limited by the battery on the computer, and that was hard for, uh, for a couple years. And we got through it together. Yeah, it was difficult. <laughs> Because uh, we would meet here as like, because, you know, we live uh, different lives, but, you know, the writing thing is similar in its way. Howard does these amazing novels, which, of course, I was a fan of before I met Howard. And but, you know, it's a solitary process of writing. It's mostly alone and often late at night. Uh, but during the day, I would come here because, you know, you, you get lonely in the room all by yourself. So. I would come here to do what I call exhibitionist writing downstairs <laughs> to like people. I would just kind of like it was a conversation. People would come and go, and uh, and, uh, and we would meet here and often talk about, you know, deepest things, you know, the, the deepest uh, emotional searches that we could uh, could navigate, and and so then when this moment arrived, and Howard happened to be up the road. And I was in the full writing crunch. And Cornelia is the editor of the book. She edited the book and she shaped it and guided it and was the main researcher. And all of those things were happening. So it, there was a kind of co-conspiracy going on here <laughs> where, you know, Corn was signaling to various people, we need you now. Come, sit there. Uh, you know, read the book and tell Ron what you think. And then uh, I won't have to tell him what I think. <laughs> And so uh, the, the intricacy of this, I'm only now realizing how <laughs> intricate it was, where she was basically getting designees to come and tell me things <laughs> that were hard to hear and, you know, would have meant we'd be in marriage counseling. So, uh, you know, <laughs> so, and then she guided it forward. And Howard was the key agent of those three in the morning calls where I'd say, Howard, I just read something. Can I read this to you? Is this just me emoting because I love these people so much? Or will this be something that someone outside of our little world would ever want to read? And Howard would say, sometimes yes, and sometimes I'm not sure, and sometimes I think you should go deeper. And I'd say, thank you, I'd hang up, and at 7 in the morning I'd call back. <laughs> and that was a great gift of, of serendipity and friendship. And, uh, and, and I think Barbara did a very nice job um, as uh, she's kind of like Schindler, a holy Gentile, Barbara, uh, with the pronunciation of shtetl. I think you did pretty well. Good job with that. Um, we should but we are living in a shtetl uh, between us and among us. So let, we, let us now, though, introduce, though, uh, the stars of our, of our book. Um, I'll, I'll go down the row. Uh, the hero of the book, designated as a real-life hero, and anyone who reads the book will understand what that's about, is, of course, Owen's hero, uh, Walter. So first, let me introduce Walter, Owen's older brother. <laughs> Known to many of you here. Known. <laughs> Again, many of you already know this story, but I'm telling you. And now, uh, and of course, as Barbara said elegantly and correctly, uh, you know, the guiding force, the captain on deck of this ship, Suskind, through 20 years of this journey across all the seas of the world is the extraordinary Cornelia, my wife. Um, Cornelia. Yeah. 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 yeah, come up, yeah. Come, and then we'll switch off. And Owen, you can use this one too. I'm and done. Walter, you can come I'm up and use, system. we'll share. Uh, you want to stand, or what do you want? To stay, I'll stand. Okay, and and with, without further ado, um, a, a, a young man who for many years said that we are all sidekicks. We don't get redrawn in this life, and we search each day at our best for our inner hero. And that uh, is a beautiful allegory that Owen writes at the end of the book, and the idea, the message is that heroism is a choice that we make every day. But of late, I think our friend is feeling, well, maybe I am the hero after all. So without further ado, Owen Susskind. Right. Thank you. Owen, what, let me ask you a question. What does it feel like to see all of these people out here who have been the key actors in your life? Feels great that I want to thank everyone for coming and supporting me. Yeah. What a, what
what movie pops into your head when you look at, at this? What song? Gosh. I gotta say Go the Distance from Disney's Hercules. Okay, now, you may not all know this song, but it's a great one. I mean, we... I would sing them a little bit of that song, because it's one of the... And who sings? Is it Phil Collins? It's Michael, Michael Bolton. Bolton. Sorry, Walt. Michael Bolton. Walter does. <laughs> I'll just sing a little bit of it, because it's really one of your theme songs. Yeah. I'll be there someday. I can go the distance. I will find my way if I can be strong. I know every mile will be worth my while. When I go the distance, I'll be right where I belong. Okay, I think let's go right. Yeah, All right, the director has arrived here. <laughs> okay, okay. Questions. Let's dive right in. Okay, we have. Want to sit down on the stage? Yeah, can we sit up here too? If you want to move over, we'll put some more chairs up in between. And uh, and the, well, the, and we can share the mic. Share the mic. Okay. The mics you can pass. We have in the audience some real ringers. Watch out for that. Uh, uh, have the capacity to ask very informed questions. And I'm hoping that you all step up. Um, okay, let's do this. You guys share this mic. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Herta. How are you? Um, well, I just started reading the book, and it just sucks you right in. Um, but I'm wondering if you can just, in a few uh, sentences, give us a little idea of the kind of research that you had to do or that you did over the course of the years to um, figure out the, the autism, uh, the, the, prob the things that were, that were affecting you and how you even came to the idea that, that, that Owen had autism. Well, that's a big, um, a big question, but Sorry. I'll, I, no, 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 it's a good question. Um, I think the short answer, the very short answer, is that um, when we moved to Washington in 93 and Owen was two and a half, um, it was very clear that something was going on. He had been typical, uh, so-called, until then. And um, he lost language and motor skills and eye contact and didn't sleep and didn't eat over a period, I would say, of two to three months one after the other very in quick succession um, and it's called regressive autism of course we had no idea at the time that's what it was um, or what was going on um, we went uh, the bummer for us was that we had just moved from Boston where we had lots of friends who were doctors to a town where we didn't have friends or doctors um, so it took us a little while, but we were really lucky to, in pretty short order, find a great developmental pediatrician. And he, uh, you know, diagnosed Owen and then really acted as our quarterback and helped educate us about what we could do at that point and the early interventions that, that we started on um, the road with through him. Um, but, you know, of course, it, it was a long road in learning, obviously, till today. Um, but that was sort of, that's a short story of how we were able to, um, and then, you know, we were researching on our own. But the, the tricky part is that when, when this happened in 93, it was, as you know, a very different world in autism. So there was much less known um, I mean, one place we started was Ivy Mount School. He, it was the first thing he said out of his mouth, practically, was there's an amazing school up the road. And so that was our starting point. Um, and we met just incredible teachers and therapists there, who we, who some of whom are here today, um, and who really educated us. I mean, the, short, the story is that I was, Ron and I were educated by these amazing teachers and therapists that we met in those early days and all the days in between 
who educated us about this, the condition and then, and then took us from there. Yes? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, I just wanted to say I have a beloved brother named Ron and he has a family very much like yours. I have an autistic niece, Susanna, and um, they've been on the same journey as you. And um, interestingly, it was sort of like a doctor in med school. I had gone to an education course on children with disabilities, and I came home one day and we had a family event. And I noticed that Susanna wasn't making eye contact with anyone, and she was kind of randomly running around, and she was doing various um, behavioral things. And I got kind of shocked and said to my mom, you know, I just read about this. This ha looks like that. And everyone was kind of in denial about it for a while. But um, what I want to say is there's a lot of public misconception about the fact that um, People think autistic kids can't make a connection sometimes, I think, even in, with their own families. And Susanna has such loving parents as Owen does. And um, it's such an extraordinary bond with her parents. And I'm guessing that Owen feels that bond and love towards his parents very strongly. Also in public, the last thing I wanted to say was um, Susanna was in a blended class in high school. Well, you know, they were sometimes blended and sometimes apart. And when she was graduating at the age of 16, um, one of the teachers didn't want her in the graduation. She was afraid that she would act up or she wanted to not deny her from going to the graduation. And Ron thought she couldn't. And then um, the principal found out and was furious. And she ended up with, I don't know, there were 50 or 60 kids in her white gown and cap. And it was such a wonderful occasion for everyone. And she was fine on the stage. And so I know, I don't know if Owen's been on similar experiences where teachers may not have always been so nice, but um, between the loving parents, she also, uh, like Owen, has made it. So Thank you for that beautiful story. Um, and I won't hog the microphone from Ron because he'll get it. But uh, <laughs> very, very quickly, I just wanted to say that that story illustrates, and we've had that play out over many different ceremonies and occasions and bar mitzvahs and weddings mm -hmm. and all kinds of things. I guarantee you that the people in that audience the family members, the teachers, and all the other kids took away much, much more that day because your niece was part of it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. So much. Sometimes when there's um, a child in a family that takes up a lot of energy because of bearing problems and disorders, it means that the other kids um, kind of can get lost more easily. Um, and then there's extra pressure for them as well to behave really well because they can't take up time when it should go to the sibling who needs it the most. So I was wondering how this was handled and how Walter could could <laughs> deal with it, and how the rest of you Absolutely. could deal with it, because it seems to me it, it, it is difficult, and it does put a lot of pressure on the other sibling. Okay. Um, yeah, that's actually, a, it's actually a, a question we've been asked before, and I think part of the, the great part about it was that my parents cut me in from a pretty young age, where... I wasn't kind of, I mean, obviously I wasn't at the kitchen table when they were making big decisions about what Owen was going to do, but I always felt like I was informed. I always felt like we were all part of Team Owen in a lot of ways. And so between that and also kind of they're just superhuman, making sure they were at all my PTA stuff, making sure they were cheering in my baseball games. Just, I mean, it's, there's no secret f formula. I think it was just a ton of effort on their part and also just kind of growing up in a way at a bit of a younger age, realizing Owen's situation and 
kind of rather than pulling back, just really diving head first in there. You know, the, um, <clears throat> the, that's fine. The, um, one of the fascinating things that's happening is we're learning a lot from the response uh, from folks like that New York Times story got at something like 330 comments. Um, and, and Walter was in it only modestly. He's in the book, of course, all through. But I think almost half those comments mention Walter. And we're like, oh, that's fascinating. And, and we are starting to see how each of us are kind of connecting with different crowds of people in what they see, because the book is written through four points of view, POV. So you're in Cornelia's shoes, you're in Owen's shoes, you're in Walter's shoes and mine. At the start, you can only be in those guys' shoes so much because they're little peanuts. But as they grow, their voices get stronger. And by the end, their voices are the strongest ones. And, and one of the things that's happened is we, we are in the middle of all sorts of very productive discussions about siblings. You know, every kid with a v challenges has a sibling, often several. And they're often not recognized for the important role they play. And, and not just a role as the growth occurs, but a life role all the way to the finish. And that's something that we learned little by little, day by day, from Walter and watching these guys together and, and, and trying to bring Walter in. But at the end, as Walter comes into his fullness, which obviously he's well into now, he, I had to do something at the end of the book, which is really almost report with Walter. Like we sat down, you know, Walt didn't exactly have this on his schedule, you know, that he's going to have to sit down with dad and tell dad in my, by my instructions things that I, Walter, least want to hear. You got to be brutal here because unless we're brutal with ourselves, there's no book. And Walter was uh, brutal. Beautifully brutal, courageous, really, saying here's what was really going on in terms of what you guys thought you were seeing and what I may have been feeling. And that growth through the book coming to a kind of fullness uh, where, you know, as Walt's asked in interviews, sometimes, you know, he's a six-year-old boy and Owen is, you know, running around like eight or nine imaginary characters at once. I mean, the library up here, there's a scene up at the Chevy Chase at the library when Owen is into a movie, pa page, the page Master. Mm, yeah. So tell them about the Page Master. Here, you can just hold this. Uh, tell them what. Tell them okay. What, when I was into that animated, live action animated children's movie. What happens in that movie? Well, tell them about it. What's I the plot? climbed. Th What's the plot of the movie? A young boy named Richard Tyler who is afraid meets three. Go Everything in the world of the library comes magically hand-drawn animated. And he meets three magical books, horror, adventure, and fantasy. And we get through those three sections in order to face his fears and find his way home. And, and one scene, um, I, when I was little, I slipped, I, uh, I, uh, Climb through the little shelf below. The library. <laughs> library. He was eight. He wasn't. You weren't that little. You were eight. Yeah. Eight. So, I mean, the the scene is I'm with Walter because Owen's into this library fantasy thing called the Page Master with Macaulay Culkin when he's still little and cute, and <laughs> and so this is what we do on a Saturday, just like this Saturday. We go to the library because Owen's into this movie, so we can that'll something he'll do, and we're up there and. Walt's 11 at this point, and I, I'm over kind of in contemporary history. Uh, they're near the checkout desk there, and I see Walter, his eyes get very wide. And I can't really see what's happening. And then I see the guy from the desk, you know, the checkout, the librarian, just kind of come around the desk kind of running, like, ah, what's happening? He's like whispering loud, like in a library you whisper loud. What are you, what are you doing, what are you doing? Well, it takes me about eight seconds to run across the library. And when I get there, Walter looks at me, turns, and runs out of the library. <laughs> you know, whew, gone. And I turn, and I see that Owen has parted the shelves. 
And as this is what happens in the movie, where Richard Tywa goes into the imaginary world. Owen is is living a very fertile life of live action and animation together at this point. And Owen is mostly in the shelf now. I see his feet you know, kicking. <laughs> and the librarian's like, what is he doing? And I said, no, no, listen, it's a movie called The Page Master. It's about libraries. You'd probably love it if you knew. <laughs> and I say, oh, you got to come out of there. And he comes out, and off we go. And, of course, we have a discussion after that outside the library. Walter's like, well, how's this going to work? <laughs> you know, he, he's growing up not knowing any of the supposed tos. Like how you're supposed to act or be or live. You know, how does this work going forward? You know, is there a time where he will learn that? And we had a real heart-to-heart -heart where Walt said, you need to really bring me in here and make me know what's up. Now, that's a moment that the kids force me, and in a way they force bo both of us to dig deeper. And as Cornelia often says, to be better than we deserve to be because we had no choice to have to explain things to them that we were learning at the same time. And that's how Walter becomes kind of a junior adult pretty early. Uh, and, and at the end, finally, I'll just end with this because I need to embarrass Walter a little bit here, <laughs> is after these moments where... As if you haven't already. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I consider my job, and many fathers will agree here, is to embarrass my, uh, my sons. That's my job. <laughs> Well, at the end of Walter's journey, where he talks quite openly about what a kid really feels, um, he comes into fullness at, at the end when he's a counselor at camp. And a lot of the kids at camp uh, don't know Walt's brother or what's up. And Walt stands up in front of the camp and says, you know, let me tell you about my real life and about the best uh, teacher that I've ever had. It's my brother. You know, that is a, a moment where Walter teaches us because really Owen has been our best teacher too. And the lessons he has taught us are ones that are the most important ones in our life and the ones that we learn anew every day as we, uh, as we go forward. So. Another question. Yes. Wow, both of them. Yeah, they both go to Catholic Chapel. Oh, KTS, yeah. yeah. Well, that Owen, they go to KTS. KTS, right? Yeah, my daughter at least just graduated. Uh-huh. And I was, we're trying to figure out the future. So I was wondering, what's the future? Yeah, Cornelia? Um, this lady was saying that her, she has two children on the spectrum, and one has just graduated, and they're looking toward the future. And you're wondering um, what Owen's future is, is looking like. Owen, um, shall I answer it or would you like to answer it? After Riverview, me, my girlfriend, Emily, and our other two friends, John and Julie, are going to an adult independent living program in Cape in Hyannis, Cape Cod, Massachusetts called LIFE. It stands for Living Independently Forever. Um, Owen left Catherine Thomas, which um, these young ladies went to, and uh, a f which is a four-year, well, it's, it's a bigger school, but he went for high school, a private special ed setting, and um, he has spent the last three years at a program on Cape Cod called Riverview, which uh, their program has an acronym too, and that's GROW, Getting Ready for the Outside World. And it's a college-like program, a college campus, dorms, social life, academics, vocational training at the community college. And after graduation on June 15th, Owen will be moving to um, a wonderful independent living community in Hyannis which um, in which they have um, limited supervision, um, but some kids more than others, but he'll live on his own in a one bedroom condo that's just being finished. And he'll work and he's, um, Owen's an artist, so yeah. he's, he's um, done a lot of artwork and will be selling some of his artwork um, probably. And he's working as a DJ at a radio station up there. Yeah very beloved in that role does a great job amazing job got great great voice for radio and um 
he works at Marshall's and so he'll probably work you know have several part-time different part-time jobs and volunteer opportunities he's a great rider horseback rider so he'll continue doing that he's a swimmer and a biker he plays golf yeah. so you know he'll have a really busy full life um, going forward I'm also gonna go to life to have that <laughs> life Walter's Walter Walter saw the one-bedroom apartment the other day and said whoa baby what the devil uh, oh, and tell, tell the gang here, though, I mean, a key moment in the success of the time at Riverview and really the success going forward is that when Owen got to this college program, one of the first things he did was start a, a club. What did Disney you... Club. Okay, tell them about what happened. Tell them when you started. When I happened. started Disney Club because the staff suggested I do it. I decided to do it every Sunday evening from 630 to 8. And what? Why did you do it? For, for me, for a lot of, <laughs> so I, I can have more people know me. That's great. And to find friends. And right? to find friends. What? Yeah. I have a oh hi! Oh, this is one of the holy ones here. Hold on. <laughs> this is Rona Schwartz. Now she is the principal, the head, the chief of Catherine Thomas School, and has been a key actor. Thank you. Oh, and you gave me my segue into my question. Um, oftentimes with individuals on the spectrum, there's often, you know, a hard time making friends and connecting with people, and there's a lot of loneliness, and um, you have been very lucky in making some very special friends who you've yeah. had for many, many years. Um, I'd like to give a little anecdote that's not in the book. Um, Let her rip, wow. I'd like to get your, your opinion on this. When Owen first started, um, we, we had dances, we still do, like four times a year, and Owen would come to each dance, but the first year or so, he'd spend each dance kind of, for about 20 minutes he would stay. He would be on the perimeter with, because of sensory issues, his hands over his ears, his face scrunched up. Remember, Owen? Yeah. And, um, and by the time he left KTS, he not only was at all the dances, but he had, a, he was a, he had his date at the prom, um, <laughs> he was on the dance floor almost the whole time um, and it was a tremendous amount of growth in just a short period of time so Owen I'd like to sort of hear from you about the friendship experience and just sort of you know think about when you first started at KTS and when you left and, and how you you changed well, when I first started at KTS I was nervous but then uh, I made a couple good friends like Connor and Brian and Aviva. Mm -hmm. And they were he, there to entertain me <laughs> and keep me company <laughs> and cheer me up. And so uh, from 2006 to 2010, life has been going good for me that way so far. And how did it change for you in being able to like stay at the dances and being a part of all of this sensory stimulation? To have fun with some of my friends. So you think the friendship part helped you? Yep. Mm -hmm. And what was the struggle you had at first with friends? Because you had friends from outside of school and friends at school. And what was that struggle? Do you remember? If if I don't lose, I add line. I explain that to them. I was afraid I would lose my old friends if, what? if I gained new ones. Mm -hmm. But what did you find out? I don't lose. I add. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, th this is actually, you can uh, list this on your health insurance as a therapy session. So a, you just <laughs> check. There's a box. <laughs> HP 101. Two more questions. Um, so, should I just hold it? Okay. Um, so my brother is autistic, uh, but I also, um, since you guys were talking about the schools and how you had him in a good school, um, when I was in middle school, it was, um, there was an election, or, um, an elective that was offered for, um, you, for the, you know, the normal kids to help out with, uh, the special needs kids and to help out with that program. And, um, I decided to do it just because, 
um, it would be, you know, I've been helping my brother my whole life. So um, I went in there and um, every, and it was first period. So I'd go in there and every morning they would say, um, what did you do last night? And all the kids would go around and say what they did. And um, there was this one girl that was really good at communication. And um, then after they would say what they did, they had them, um, you know, just have sort of a free time. So I would read with her and we would just read like uh, they had Berenstein Bears, all those books. And um, I would do what I do with my brother, which is I'll read a page, then you read a page, just sort of like keep the story going, but, you know, have them uh, exercise their brain. And um, then after a while, um, one of the teachers noticed that I was doing that and then she took me aside and she was like, she can't do that, you can't be doing that with her. And um, I was like, what are you talking about? And she was just saying that um, the kids, you know, they, they weren't able to do that yet. Like they had not reached that level, but then I was just sort of thinking, um, yes, she can read. And it was just very horrifying because they were teaching them like things that don't matter as much. Like they were teaching them, you know, how to, know certain colors and how to read certain numbers and they would just do that every single day so I was wondering if um you were going into looking at things like that or um how you really felt about uh the private schools and those helping um I you know I would love Walter to Walter can talk about this a little bit in terms of uh, his experience with Owen but um I would say we were unbelievably lucky, as I mentioned earlier, in that we were appointed to a great school to start with. And school for kids on the spectrum and for the parents to to find and choose and get the right one is an incredibly difficult process. And it was difficult for us over the years. Um, anyone who reads the book can see that. Because the kids change so much all the time, and there's such big ups and downs, it's hard for the schools and it's hard for the parents. And trying to make that fit is just a really difficult thing. Um, we were incredibly lucky to find great schools along the way, um, but there were there were years when when we were in the boat where where you were, where we felt frustrated and annoyed. Um, and I think that we did exactly what you did, which is such a smart thing that you did, which is say, wait a minute, I think I know, I think I know what I'm talking about here. I've been working with my brother. I know my brother. I know kids like my brother. And I think you're right. You're wrong and I'm right. And sometimes you have to do that. You have to sort of put it out there and be gutsy and, and make people not so happy with you w when you know what's right. Um, so I really applaud you for 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 doing that and for continuing. Thank you for that segue. Yeah. Uh, into what I wanted to say, I was a special ed teacher for a lot of years, and in the past eight years, um, have become a part-time professor in the field of autism and had not encountered autism. And I want to say, I'm kind of writing a book right now about one year in one child's life. And I learned 90% of what I know about autism and what I teach other teachers about autism from parents, from mothers. Thank you so much for standing up and say, how can we not do this? I learned everything from you, and I learned from getting inside the head of little Justin and watching him every day and listening to what he had to say. And parents, we as educators don't listen to you enough, and we should. And thank you so much, because if we just, there are lessons that you teach us all the time. We just have to step back and hear them. So thank you. Thank you. How about we have everybody uh, say one thing, all four of us, at the finish here. Let's go down the row. Or why don't you go first, just to, to talk to this crowd. <laughs> and then we'll be off the stage, because I think, I think the last question has been asked. So, Walt, you start. Wasn't quite sure about my prompt on that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
I guess the way my dad introduced it at the beginning, there's something special about being able to talk to different groups of people, but particularly when it's the characters that have filled us along the way. And we were having a discussion a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were out in L.A. and we were talking about different movies from our you know Disney catalog that have really resonated. And one of them was The Jungle Book. And <laughs> who's your favorite character? I'd say all of them. All of them. Very diplomatic. Um, <laughs> so we were talking about the journey of Mowgli in this book. And Bagheera and all his pals are trying to get Mowgli to the man village. Yeah. And in a way, kind of what we've been doing and so many people in this room have been doing is bringing Owen on that path to the man village. And, awesome. and, it's, a, and it's a journey that... Like you has some ups and downs, but everyone plays a part in it. And now we see we've seen Owen arrive, and he's arrived years ago, but he's really fully arrived in a lot of ways. And this book is kind of a celebration of that arrival, arri final arrival. And thank you all for you know being here and being part of being part of that journey. You wanna, maybe I'll finish the bottom. Why don't you go next? Oh, oh, okay. You want to so you wanna, wait. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, Walter. <laughs> Hard to follow that. Um, I just want to say that for us, um, this is a more personal note, but, but we moved a couple of years ago, and being in this, in this store today with all of these friends and familiar faces, here is so overwhelming and amazing and I think it will be should be our final act in this book Ron will disagree but there could be no greater um, afternoon for me than to be here today and have the support of everyone here it's just amazing an amazing feeling and I just want to thank every single person who came out today Owen's Owen's life and our life um, it's been kind of a crazy process opening it up to the public but I feel very at home here today and thank you guys so much okay so I'll I'll go and then you go after me how about that okay. all right so uh, I just um Howard was saying and the beautiful therapist what she said about how the community uh, is responding and I just have, you know, being an old reporter, I have some news I can report that's very heartening that, um, that we are getting major institutions, uh, Yale, MIT, Cambridge University, Duke now, who are looking anew at something they thought they understood, which are these affinities. All right, now every kid in the spectrum, and adults too, and all of us in a way, have our affinities. You know, I mean, look, I've got one too, you know. I've been doing imitations of presidents since I'm this big, you know, and now what's what I do, basically. Uh, you know, we all have pa <gasps> Where's the thing? I just want to say that man in the back. I do love you. I love you. <laughs> you know, and, and, and the, the fact is, is that we're allowed to, Cornelia said, you know, this is one of Cornelia's lines, I'm stealing this, is she says, we're allowed to have our passions. But often these kids are not because it's seen as to the exclusion of all else. We say, that's not true. And the fact is, draw a line between passion and obsession. Well, they say obsession is to the exclusion of all else. But if so, if the challenge is so great for you to be interested in those other things by virtue of the neurological hand you may have been dealt, well, I don't know where to draw that line. And so after lots of give and take and lots of experimenting over 20 years, we eventually said, just go with his bliss and see if we can make it our bliss too, which is why we saw Dumbo so many times <laughs> that Cornelia at one point did run away with the circus just to get out of the house. If only. If only, no, I, I <laughs> actually that'd be more for me. I could be one of the guys in the Volkswagen getting out of the car. Um, but what's happening, which is so exciting, is that these so-called affinities um, you know, Thomas the Tank or anime or 40s and 50s black and white movies or Disney 
or almost anything. There's a, an array of them that many people in the spectrum community embrace, and they're not that different from what's embraced in the wider society. The key is they put such intensity into it, often because the rest is a lot of noise, that, that the term is context blind. We're context able, because it's something people do instinctively. They say they're context blind because they can't pick up all the social cues and the notion of where I sit versus the atmospheres. Well, you know, their context deep is what they are in the chosen areas, 1,000 feet. And once you get through the obstacle course that's most of public education these days, you know, if you can embrace that context and get other people to embrace it and nourish it, it's amazing the capabilities that are visible. I mean, Owen has come up with concepts that the guys at Disney are going, how's he doing that? How does he understand our movies better than we do? We made them. That's a sign for people to go, maybe my notions of human value or ability versus disability aren't quite right. That's a lovely moment of opening of pores. And now what is happening is that people are gonna study these affinities, not so much as, as prison, as pathway. And that's what's happening. And it could create a great new period where along with all the possible things that might happen for therapists, that the thing that we say but often don't buy or embrace, which is different, not less, actually becomes something that we really believe because we feel it. And that's so exciting. And that's something that many people in the room felt over the years and that we felt day by day. So that's why this is a celebration in so many ways and maybe for lots of people as we go forward. Now, I'm just gonna sort of join here with Owen because often Owen finishes one of these things as he did at Disney last week by, a, 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 you, can we, you wanna do a few voices quick? Okay. Okay. So now you're thinking a lot about love. You want to you want to do okay, that love I'll business? Do it. Love business? Yeah. Okay. So step up here. Now, now tell them what this is. They not, might not know this movie. Describe the this scene. This is one of my favorite childhood Disney animated classic films, The Sword and the Stone. Okay. What happens in this scene? Well, who's in it? Merlin the wizard telling Arthur the little young boy about love. I'll do it. You do Arthur. I'm going to do Arthur? Okay, okay. Thank God, Arthur only has one line, so I'm good. <laughs> go ahead, you go, go ahead. He's Merlin, go ahead. You know, boy, that love business is a powerful thing. Greater than gravity? Ah, uh, yes, boy. I, I'd say it's the greatest force on earth. So w we want to tell you all that we love you, and it is truly the greatest force on earth. Thank you for coming out today. Take a bow. Take a bow. I'll take it out of here.